I want you to join me in the book of Luke chapter 9. Um, we're going to kind of lay a platform for where we're going to go uh, in the message this morning from this passage of text. Luke chapter 9, verse 38, it says, And now when they had come down from the mountain, a great multitude met Jesus. And suddenly a man from the multitude cried out saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and suddenly he cries out. It convulses him, and it departs from him with great difficulty. It even bruises him. And so I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. It's the words of a struggling father. I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Father, help us today. Move us forward with the unction that only heaven can bring. I pray, God, for the help of the Holy Spirit, for the anointing, for a special grace. Provoke each of us, God, to that next step in you, whatever it might be. Let it be done in Jesus' name. And this church said, amen. So this morning, we're concluding the series that we've been in entitled, Hold Your Peace. And what we mean by that is that the Bible is clear that the chastisement of our peace was upon Jesus when he was on the cross. So heaven has paid a high price for us to experience peace. And scripture is clear that God does desire for us to hold the peace of heaven in our earthly life. In fact, we're told that he gives us peace, therefore we should not be troubled. However, there is a lot of struggling that is going on in the world today, and so many people are absent of peace. And one of the issues that is a, a, a real dilemma is the fact that over 450 million people in the world today are struggling in regards to their mental health. And so we've taken a few weeks to, to look at that subject from a scriptural standpoint. And it, it does seem like that sometimes talking about uh, a subject like that has some taboo elements with it, especially when it comes to the church. But the reason that we've taken a number of weeks to talk about it is because we believe that God desires for Three Trees Church to be a place where that anyone can be set free from any condition because of the power of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, as we read this text in Luke chapter 9, what you notice is that there is a boy that is struggling in his mind and as a result, his family is also struggling. The scripture even specifically points out that his father is struggling. And so I want to unpack a message entitled, How to Help Someone Who is Struggling. How to Help Someone Who is Struggling. You may be a spouse um, that is married to someone who is struggling in their mind. It's possible that you're a parent, maybe you're a coach, maybe you're an employer, Maybe you're a mentor, maybe you're a friend, and you're directly connected to someone that is struggling, and like you, you want to help. Like I, I've noticed, like the majority of us, when we see someone is struggling, like we want to help. And, and sometimes, even when you see someone struggling, you'll initially get like this surge of energy of like, I want to help. But when you begin to assist someone that is struggling in their mind, like there's a lot of ups and downs with that. And, and, and you go through these periods where there's the ups and downs of treatments. There's the trial periods of prescriptions. There's the swings from disengagement to despair. There's even hospitalizations and sometimes uh, someone attempting to, to like harm them, themselves. And, and so what happens is that after this initial energy of I want to help, after you've sent a bunch of texts of encouragement and you've provided a bunch of acts of service and you've just tried to help in general, uh, that energy can start to disappear very quickly because the realization arrives that after months of month, months and months in the helping phase, and that starts winding down, like you, you face the hard reality that no matter how many meals you provide or how many gifts you give, it just doesn't resolve the issue. And making matters even worse is that like when somebody breaks a bone, there's a timetable for the healing process. But when someone begins to struggle in their mind, there's not always a timetable for that. And so you, it's not like you can like set a date on the calendar and like this is when it'll be fixed. This is when the healing will transpire. This is when the broken thing will be put back together. And so one person actually shared this. They said, 
the, this lack of a timetable, the uncertainty and the inconsistency, it creates an awkwardness. And eventually, it even caused me to feel helpless to help. And like, I wonder, like, if, if you are helping someone that is struggling, like, is it possible that maybe you also are in a place where that initial surge of energy has subsided and maybe now you're starting to deal with your own struggle, struggling to continuing to continue to help? And so, like, I'm guessing that in this room, there's probably a lot of you that, like, some of you have tried to help but you realize that what you said or the things you did actually made it worse. And maybe even other times, like you felt unqualified or you felt uninformed and maybe that paralyzed you. And now you look back and you realize, oh man, I missed my opportunity. And then there's others of you, like you've just been in the trenches trying to help in this battlefield of the mind for so long that you've reached a point where that you're not only exhausted, you're actually angry that the battle is not already over. And so what will start to happen is that when you start to, to struggle in that regard, you're struggling as a helper. Like the enemy starts to tell you that you are not making a difference. And so you think, well, maybe I should just quit and maybe sh I shouldn't even try to help anymore. But I believe like I have an unction of the Holy Spirit this morning to encourage you with the fact that Christ often comes to people through people. I want to say it again. Christ often comes to people through people. So I want you to revisit with me in Luke chapter 9 this, this story from the Gospels that we've looked at. And what we see is that there is a father and he has a son that is struggling with mental illness. And the boy seems to have insomnia. He seems to have erratic speech. He's having seizures. And eventually like this battle in this child's mind becomes all-consuming for the family. Like, it's not hard to guess that probably the father had had to miss work. He probably had had to let friendships fade. He probably was at a point where he was no longer able to do some of the hobbies that he enjoyed. It's possible that even his marriage has been put on the back burner. He's trying to get his son fixed. He loves his son. He wants to help his son. He wants his son to no longer struggle. But along the way, the dad is also struggling. And one of the reasons he's really struggling is because this condition is not getting better. This condition is getting darker. In fact, the boy begins to scream violently. He begins to say these awful obscenities, and he even starts to harm himself. The Bible says in one passage that he would throw himself into the fire and throw himself into the water. And it, it's, it's, it's challenging. But, but this father even though he was probably scared out of his mind about what his son was struggling with, was determined to help his son. And so you get the sense that he's taken him to every specialist that would have been available in those ancient times. If it were in today's setting, he would have been Googling everything he could possibly think to Google to try to get an answer. He would have been reading all the blogs and all the articles, and he would have been following all the influencers. Like, he's just trying to find some way to, like, help his son. But regardless, nothing was successful. And then the dad hears about a teacher and his disciples who are traveling through the nation of Israel and they are healing people that had otherwise been labeled incurable. And so he, he, he searches out the, this teacher and he first finds his disciples and he brings his boy to the disciples. And he's like, this is my moment. This is the time when my family finally gets the breakthrough. And yet the disciples pray for the boy and nothing happens. Can you imagine? Like the pain, the agony of like, I thought this struggle was about to end and like they're not able to fix this for me. And so I think we need to pick up the story in verse 37. The next day, after the disciples have failed, they come down a mountain and a large crowd meets Jesus. And this father in the crowd calls out to Jesus, teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He's my only child. An evil spirit keeps seizing him and it makes him scream. It throws him into convulsions to the point that he foams at the mouth. It, it batters him and it hardly ever leaves him alone. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't do it. 
And then Jesus motioned for the boy. And as the boy came forward, the demon knocked him to the ground and threw him into a violent convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the, rebuked the evil spirit and healed the boy and then gave him back to his father and awe gripped the people as they saw this majestic display of God's power. Come on, somebody. Does anybody still believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever and that what people can't fix, <laughs> Jesus can still resolve? Like can, can you imagine the joy and the relief and the awe that swept over that crowd? Like even in reading it together today, like it just reminds us that there's no condition that Jesus cannot change. There is no darkness he cannot light up. There is no chain he cannot break. God can do the impossible when Jesus shows up. But here's what I don't want you to miss. The boy found healing through Christ's power, right? The boy found healing through Christ's power. But the boy met Christ because of his father's persistence. And there needs to be an encouragement for someone that is struggling to help someone who is struggling. That you may be an essential part of the kingdom connection, the divine appointment that God wants to bring to pass. You may be the one that plays a key role in facilitating the moment where that person that's struggling finally meets Christ. And so I think this boy, he gets his miracle because someone fought through discouragement and difficulties. And maybe like somebody this morning needs to be encouraged to keep praying, to keep encouraging, to keep serving, because your compassion communicates Christ's compassion. And your expression of love is an expression of God's love. And it's possible that the person that's struggling, they get to know that God cares because you care. And so don't ever forget that Jesus comes to people through people. And so this morning, spouse, parent, friend, leader, mentor, coach, like how do you help someone that is struggling with their mental health? I just want to give you a handful of steps. Number one, step number one, be present. Practice the ministry of being present. There's a researcher that began to evaluate uh, ancient times. And what he, what he discovered is that survival depended on collaborating. So in order to survive, like people had to work together. They had to work together to build shelters. They had to work together to prevent, uh, to protect them, their people from predators. They had to work together to hunt. They had to work together to gather food. In fact, he came to the conclusion that people's ability to unite in ancient times was like their superpower. However, today, like human beings are becoming increasingly isolated. We're becoming increasingly disconnected. We, we no longer band together as we did in previous times. We're no longer in tribes. Uh, and, and so what's happening is that we're experiencing like this fallout of disbanding. And so now there's some medical conclusions that it's making us sick. In fact, did you know that studies now show that our IQ drops as much as 30 points when we are isolated? Now, I don't know about you, but I can't afford to lose those 30 points. <laughs> I, that's why we're having small group Sunday. <laughs> Is because we need community. We need fellowship. We cannot allow the enemy to isolate us, to annihilate us. And the Bible encourages community. Acts chapter 2, when God was launching the early church, the Lord made it clear that he desired for his people to dwell together in unity, to do life together. Did you know that they've also proven now that isolation raises the level of our cortisol, which is like the stress hormone? And what it does is it contributes to depression and it contributes to increased panic attacks. And so a friend of mine says it this way, and I think it's brilliant. He says, what we must learn is that the presence of a friend is as powerful as a prescription. The presence of a friend is as powerful as a prescription. 
But like, let's be honest for a minute. Like, it can be intimidating to be present. Be, because some of you are thinking, well, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, what if I make things worse? I, I, don't, I don't have the answers. Listen, I get it. I, I, I really get it. I understand your dilemma if that's something you're struggling with. Because, like, I, I feel like kind of the way I approach life is I'm a fixer. And so like, even in, in the consulting that Mandy and I do, like, more often than not, the way the engagement start is, hey, Eric, can you come help me fix this? And like that gets my motor turning. Like even in the church, like sometimes it's when a system's broke or something needs to be reworked. That that's when I get the most excited because I want to engineer some kind of fix. I want to help bring a solution. Like that's when I feel like I'm the most valuable. And, and, and maybe you also are like a person that likes to fix things. And, and if that's the case, like you may have to learn what I've had to learn. And other people have had to download this to me and, and help me to understand it, is that sometimes you just must practice the ministry of being present. And what that means is that you don't always need an answer that will fix it. And, and I guess, like, if you're a fixer, you doubt, well, I, I just, just being present ain't going to fix nothing. Well, I don't know. Jesus said this, Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be with them. And you being the second person, you being the third person, you choosing the ministry of being present may set the stage for the kingdom connection, the divine appointment that that person needs with Jesus Christ. See, when you don't have all the answers, then choosing to simply be present can cause the answer to show up. And so simply entering the space or entering the situation or simply showing up like it says to the person that they're not forgotten, that like somebody still sees them. And like even if you sit in silence, they know someone sees them. I cannot tell you how many times in 23 years of pastoral ministry that I've been called into a situation that was absolutely horrific and traumatic things transpiring to the point that the vocabulary doesn't even have the ability to describe them. And you walk in and you're like, okay, well, I know I can share a scripture and I know I can offer a prayer, but past that, like I don't know what to say. And I've learned sometimes there's nothing like the ministry of being present. Sometimes you just sit there in silence and you just let the person know, I see you. And when you do that as a Christian, when you do that as a follower of Jesus, it also has a way of letting that person know that God sees them. Let me give you step number two. Be honest. Like sometimes you just have to admit that you don't always understand. And when somebody's going through a battle of their mind, like you're just not always going to understand it. And if you work in the arena of mental health, then like you know that uh, maybe you're familiar with the DSM-5. And what that is is a, a book on the subject that has 947 pages. It has 123,500 words. Here's the point. The mind is an extremely complex subject. When someone is going through depression, it is an extremely complex subject. When someone is going through anxiety, it is an extremely complex subject. When someone is battling suicidal thoughts, it is an extremely complex subject. When someone in their mind is struggling with addiction, it is an extremely complex subject. And so what we have to realize is that we, we have to move away from this human nature that wants to portray that we know more than we do. There's just something in us that just wants to portray that we've got the answer, that we've got it figured out. And if you do that, it usually manifests into saying things that does not help the person that you want to help. Because if you're not careful, you'll say silly things like, well, this ain't nothing compared to what I went through. Stop. Yeah. Or, or you start suggesting like quick fixes or ideas and, and you have no training and no credibility. Or, or you let the enemy trick you into becoming overly spiritual and you start becoming overly eccentric and you start sounding foolish to the person that you're trying to help. And so like if you want to ensure that our spiritual enemy has no influence over the people we care about, then we have to make sure that we give him no opportunity to offend through our carelessness or our ignorance. Here's what Proverbs 12, 18 says, the words of a thoughtless person cut like swords, 
but the tongue of, a wise, of wise people brings healing. We learn this, words are like a sword or they're like a scaffold. They will either kill or they will heal. And so what determines which way your words go? Wisdom. And the Bible is clear that if any man lacks wisdom, if he will seek God, he will give it to all men liberally. The Bible even says that he that winneth souls is wise. And sometimes when someone is struggling in their mind, they're actually struggling in their soul. It's deep within them. And you're going to need the wisdom of the Lord to help navigate them through that. And the only way you can do that is you have to be humble enough to keep learning and also humble enough to keep leaning on the help of the Holy Spirit in those situations. Step number three. Be a friend. And I would say it this way. Offer a friendship that is free of judgment. Listen, I got a lot of friends. And there is yet still only a few of them that when I know we're going to get together, I don't worry about fixing my hair. I don't worry about putting on nice clothes. If we're going to take a ride together somewhere, I do not clean out my truck. Like, we just roll with it. You know why? Because for that, 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 that very small handful of people, they, I just know they accept me for who I am. And I don't got to prove anything to them. They're not going to judge me if my hair is not fixed. They're not going to judge me if my truck's not clean. They're not going to judge me if I'm not dressing stylish. I hope I got friends in the house today. Don't judge. <laughs> they just accept me. And so, like... If you want to make a difference in someone's struggle, you got to be the type of friend that chooses to create some judgment-free spaces. It doesn't mean you'll never speak truth. It means that when you speak truth, it will be saturated in love. It means that your speech will be filled with grace and only slightly seasoned with salt. It means that you're going to help this person that you care about overcomes shame because shame is a secondary struggle of any battle in the mind. And really, the definition of shame could be said to be this. It is a sense of deep inadequacy. When someone is battling suicidal thoughts, they're battling shame. When somebody is unable to control the, the, the swings from one polar of their mind to the next, they're battling shame. And so it's easy to start thinking that like God is disappointed or that God is angry or that God is even just downright disgusted. But you get to be a person that befriends them in spite of the struggle. And you get to live out Romans 15, 7, which says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. And this will bring praise to God. How did Christ accept you? Just as you are. You don't get good to get God. You get God to get good. And so he accepts you just as you are. There is no failure. You can, he can't forgive. There is no weakness that's going to intimidate his strength. There's no sickness that he's going to run away from. He accepts us just as, we, just as we are, and he shows us that that is the example that he desires for us to give to other people. And so you have to create a space for the person who is struggling that's free of judgment where shame has no power to stay. You have to become a great listener and a great encourager. And if you listen to people talk with the sole objective of coming up with what you're going to say in return, you are not a great listener. God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Because sometimes people just need a listener. Somebody who will just hear them out and just let them talk and you listen from a desire to figure out how to pray for them better, how to care for them better, how to, how to be a, a, a better friend. I, one of my buddies, in fact, Jonathan, he's going to be here Wednesday. He is the most incredible gift giver I've ever met. And one day I asked him, I'm like, Jonathan, like, how, how have you just mastered gift giving like this? He said, I just listen. You can like say something to him in one sentence and you think he's not even paying attention. And then like your birthday will come or some other special event in your life and he'll bless you with that gift. And you're like, how did he? He listened. And sometimes the person who's struggling in their mind, they just need somebody to listen. 
And by listening closely, God's going to use you to be a part of giving them the gift of peace. To be a great encourager. Listen, we may not be able to give all the answers, but we can always be able to give encouragement. Zig Ziglar talks about the way to know if someone needs encouragement is to figure out if they're breathing or not. And so step number four is be an encourager. And I would say to you, if you're going to encourage somebody who's struggling in their mind, the number one thing you need to encourage is purpose. Because the opposite of depression is not happiness. It's purpose. And so, like, every single person has a purpose. And, and, and even if they're, they're struggling in their mind, even if there's some kind of disorder that they're wrestling with, they still have a purpose. But what happens is that the struggle will blind you to your purpose. And so what we need is like people in our life that will help draw attention to the gifts that God has put in us and help remind us of the calling that God has placed on us. And, and if you need that, then just imagine how much the person that you know who is struggling needs that. And like as crazy as it sounds, the quickest way to defeat despair that comes with a battle of the mind is to redirect attention from ourselves to the needs of other people. To help that person be reminded of the purpose God has put in their life to be a blessing to somebody else. The calling that he's placed upon them. It's going to help them forget what is behind and the struggle and press towards the prize of the high calling. That's what Paul said. And so in Cambodia, uh, there was a researcher by the name of Dr. Derek Summerfield. And he was doing a study on depression. And he went into Cambodia and he thought that it would be beneficial to begin to evaluate how many people might need the prescription of antidepressants. And so as he was working through that, he began to speak with some local medical staff, which actually connected him with some local farmers. And he's explaining, hey, we just want to figure out if you're struggling with depression. And then we want to work through some prescriptions. And the people are asking, well, what would the prescription do? And he explains how that the prescription would help. And, and they look at him and they say, oh, we already have that. He's like, you, you mean you already have prescriptions for depression? Oh, yes. Well, can you take me to the people who have received this prescription? He says, yes, we have a farmer. We can take you to him. And the story of this farmer is that he was working in a rice field and he experienced an, in uh, an injury as a result of equipment failure. He lost one of his legs. He had to get a prosthetic. He went back into the rice field because of the marshy conditions of harvesting rice. He was struggling with the prosthetic and he was unable to continue to be a rice farmer. He had to re retire to his house. In doing so, he just felt like he had no value. He felt miserable. He was down and out. And he began to wrestle with depression. He began to talk as though he had suicidal thoughts. His family began to try to seek help. And as they talked among the community and even got some medical advice, they realized the way to, they came up with an idea to help this man with his grief. They bought him a cow. And then another cow. And then another cow. And they were milk cows. And every day, the man, despite the loss of his leg, was able to go out, sit down on a stool, and milk those cows. And he started providing an income for his family. And when purpose was restored, he was no longer depressed, and joy turned to his life. And so, maybe somebody just needs a cow. Listen, when I've noticed this in my own life. And I'm sure you have too. When we realize our life matters, it lessens our struggle. And some of the people that you know that are struggling the most in their mind just need to be reminded that their life matters. And a way that you can encourage them is to focus on what they can do, not on what they can't do. To point out opportunities, not limitations. And to point out that they are made by God to make a difference. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 21 and 22, Paul says, I have sent to you my friend for this very purpose, that he may encourage you. Like, like Paul knew that even churches need to be encouraged to the point that he would send somebody to remind an entire church of their purpose. Step number five, be persistent. We learn from that father in Luke chapter 9, persistence pays off when you're trying to connect somebody to Jesus. I would challenge you, give strong consideration to keep showing up. It's the toughest of all struggles to help somebody with the battle of the mind. 
because it's so messy. And that person will have setbacks when they get hurt. And then as a result, you're going to get hurt. And sometimes it's going to seem like progress is coming in just such small increments. But I want to show you something. So this is the last thing I'll share with you this morning. There was a sociologist by the name of Rodney Stark. And he became infatuated with trying to figure out how did Christianity become so prominent in the Roman Empire? Like, how, how was it able to succeed? Like, how did it grow from nothing to this worldwide force? And what he discovered is that initially Christians had no credibility. They had no influence until the Roman Empire began to experience epidemics and pandemics, like the smallpox and, and, and the plague. And what started happening is that sometimes during those outbreaks of plagues, as many as 5,000 people would die per day in Rome. And for the most part, people just responded in panic because they worshiped these false gods. And when they read the writings of Homer and they read what the Greek god Zeus would have to say, they found no answers in caring for sick people. In fact, one historian notes, at the first onset of disease... The Romans would push sufferers away. They fled from their, even their dearest, closest relatives, throwing them into the roads before they were even dead, and they treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby they would avert the spread and contagion of fatal disease. And in the middle of that, there was a group of people who were followers of a teacher from Israel, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And their response was totally different to culture. And a third century bishop of Alexandria records the response of Christians in this way. He said, while everyone else was running away from the sick, heedless of the danger, Christians took charge of the sick, attending to their every need, ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy. And for they were infected by others with disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors, and yet they cheerfully accepted their pains. They cheerfully accepted their pains. They cheerfully accepted their struggle. Why? Because until you are close enough to struggle, you are not close enough to make a difference. And the fact that you are struggling to help the person that is struggling and in need of help proves you are still close enough to make a difference. I want you to pray with me. Father, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you, God, that over the last few weeks they have so intently and in such, with such engagement leaned in and said, I want to be able to make a difference. Now, God, for some of us, it has had to start with us first. We've had to experience some healing and some accelerated deliverance in our own life. But God, this morning as we close out this instruction to hold our peace so that we might give it to others, I, I, I pray, God, that there's going to be just a sweeping touch of the Holy Spirit that comes over the, the lives of those who are struggling to help people who need help. That God, they're tired, they're exhausted, they're fatigued, they're worn out, but God, they still wanna help. God, I believe that you put that unction within them, that you put that compassion within them, that God, compassion is one of the most Christ-like traits because over and over again in the gospels, it says that you were moved with compassion and then God, you would step into a city and turn it upside down with healing, delivering, and saving power. And so God, today to the person that is struggling to continue to help, I ask you, God, to encourage them, to lift their head, to empower them with the work of the Holy Spirit, to remind them of their purpose so that they might remind the person who is struggling of his or her own purpose. And God, first and foremost, any of us that are in this room that need salvation, may we realize the greatest peace we can ever receive regards our eternity. And may we see the cross of Jesus Christ. May we see the bloodshed. May we see the nails. May we see the crown of thorns and understand that that agony of crucifixion was a result 
of Jesus taking the wrath of heaven for our sin. And may we recognize that now we can call upon Jesus as Savior. We can acknowledge and commit our life to him as Lord. And that God, old things can pass away. Everything can become new. We can become a new creature in you. And that Lord, the greatest peace we'll ever have will not just be temporal in the here and now but it will be for eternity, for 10,000 upon 10,000 years. God, if somebody needs to pray that prayer, give them the courage to do it right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. This church said...